Good morning, Woodland Hills. My name is Dan Kent. I'm going to be doing announcements today, which uh, I usually kind of get nervous for because there's a lot of details I have to remember. So I brought some friends with me to encourage me. And uh, no, I, I'm kidding. I, I don't have that many friends, but uh, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> that's not true. I have a lot of friends. I am here to uh, get us ready for worship. And this is just a thought that I, I have. Um, I think, I believe that the Holy Spirit is looking to fill our lives with vitality and to refresh us anew every day. But we have to open our hearts to that. And uh, so I would encourage you to just put everything else in your life uh, aside and just focus on praising God uh, with your fellow brothers and sisters. And I tell you what, the choir this morning is going to help because I've heard them twice and uh, I feel very refreshed. So thanks for joining us and thanks for joining us online. And let's praise God together.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's celebrate the breaking of those chains. Amen.
this worship song. Before you sit down, just take a moment to say hi to your neighbor, and if you are online, just drop a how are you in the chat.
Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Kent. I'm a teaching pastor here. Wasn't that awesome, the choir? Man. Yeah. Even George and I were kind of, you know, it wasn't, it was, it, it was beautiful, but it wasn't pretty. That's what I'll say. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Dan. I have just a couple quick announcements I want to share, uh, really important ones. The first one is we have this thing, this, uh, uh, it's a class, it's a training. Uh, it's called Family Rituals, and it is just the coolest thing. It's one of my favorite things that we do here because I think that we tend to live automated lives. We tend to figure things out. We figure out what we do and we just kind of become automated. And we have these habits and rituals that we don't even know that we're doing. And some of those are good, but a lot of those can be sneaky destructive. And so what this uh, kind of training does is it helps with family rituals that are constructive, that can help uh, people in the family to see the meaning of Christ in our day-to-day -day life. And it can shape really good rituals going forward and in particular, particular, this one is going to be about the bedtime ritual uh, for kids. And so, I mean, we all have to put our kids to bed. And so why not use this as an opportunity to create a, a meaningful momentum in your kid's life for the rest of their life? It's, it's such a beautiful, beautiful training. This takes place on April 28th, and there's going to be childcare and pizza. And, and it's also awesome. Uh, it's, Bill Doherty has helped a team here to kind of put this together, and I think it's just absolutely brilliant. So sign up for that if you're interested. I think this is so important. In fact, it's best for if you have like kindergarten to elementary school kids. Uh, if you don't have kids, maybe think about getting some just so you can take this class because <laughs> that's how good it is. It really, it's uh, seriously, I'm... Su yeah, I'm super excited about this. So you can go to the bulletin page, whchurch.org slash bulletin, and you can sign up there. The second announcement is we have our annual Covenant Partners meeting, and that is coming up on May 19th, so just a little over a month. Put it on your calendars now because spring and summer start to get busy fast. So it's May 19th. It goes until about 1230 right after the service. So it's a Sunday right after the service. It goes till about 1230. And we're going to do a few things for there. There will also be uh, refreshments there. There will also be child care. You have to sign up for the child care. Uh, but we're going to basically reflect on all the cool things that we've been able to do over this past year and start to anticipate some of the cool things that we're going to do next year. We also have a special guest who uh, is going to talk to us about our food shelf ministry, which I'm just so proud to be a part of. It's su such a great ministry. And uh, so we have Jessica Francis, who is the executive director at Today's Harvest, who we're partnering with. She's going to kind of talk about that partnership and, and uh, teach us more about that. So I, I just think that's going to be really great. So if you're a covenant partner, uh, sign up for that. If you're not a covenant partner, you can also find out about becoming a covenant partner on our website. Uh, so sign up up at whchurch.org slash bulletin. Whew, that was close. <laughs> uh, all right, then the, the final thing that we do during worship is we take up an offering. And uh, as I was sort of dancing to the music, uh, I, I, I was thinking about the choir and how you have all these voices and they just come together in such a beautiful way that you, like any individual, you don't feel that same power. But together, you can do really great things. And I would just encourage you to think like, as you consider your offering, this is an opportunity to put your resource in part of a really big thing. And we're doing some really great things here. So uh, take a moment to uh, consider your offering. If you're in-house here, we have some offering boxes in the back. If you're online, you can uh, do your offering on our app or on our website. And with that, I'm just going to pray for the offering and we will hear from Greg. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, just refreshing our spirits and bringing us together what a great opportunity to praise God with so many like-minded people and so many who are seeking you. And I just pray that uh, you bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dragons, angels, and beasts, lions, lambs, and vultures, the weird and fantastical imagery in the book of Revelation is confusing and unsettling. But when we read these visions in the right context, they can open our eyes. Revelation is a book about unveiling truth and unmasking lies. The church, the bride of Jesus, is dear to his heart, and she is in the thick of this battle between truth and lies. 
In Revelation, Jesus gives both encouragement and challenge to sustain the church. He tells her, I know you, I see you, and well done. But also, repent, you have strayed from the light. And most importantly of all, be faithful, be victorious, I am coming. What words of challenge and encouragement does Jesus have for us today in the battle between truth and lies? Good morning, Woodland Hills. God bless you guys. So good to see you all here this morning. Uh, those of you who are in the auditorium and those of you who are visiting online, participating that way, really, really good to be here together. Um, what do you think of that choir? <laughs> Wasn't that awesome? That good... That, that, that was fantastic. That was just, uh, man, that was, uh, you, you know, the Holy Spirit's moving because George's foot was tapping. I saw it. Your foot was tapping. Okay, now God's moving. <laughs> We're going to loosen you up a little bit here, George. All right. Yeah, you and Dan, you're both kind of like, so anyways, that, 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 was, that, that was great. Uh, I, I, I love uh, worship set like that. Gives me a chance to try out my new knee. I, I can jump up and down, see? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we've been in the series. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention this before I get into this. Um, you know, our eyes are always on the horizon, and, and our hope is in, in Jesus Christ appearing and, and God transforming this world at the end of the age. That's our ultimate hope. But in the meantime, we're called to be peacemakers and using our say-so as kingdom people to be praying for peace wherever possible and working for peace wherever possible. And right now, you may have noticed that this world is in great need of peace. Um, the last... Yesterday, Iran uh, set off some missiles in retaliation for what Israel's bombing of a building and killing the sons of the Hamas leader, and this merry-go-round just keeps on going on and on. And, and the fear all along has been that this thing's going to widen and get regional, and um, depending on what happens next, we'll see. But it, this, we are in a real precarious situation, folks. This has uh, got all, this is a, uh, it could very easily become a, region-wide conflict, already to some degree is, but it could become full-fledged in and, and that, and then you add on to the whole thing, the Russia-Ukraine thing, and then there's China, and we're just in a very, very tense spot here. And so just please keep that, just keep you praying for that. You know, all the politics aside, the politics are incredibly complex, people have all these opinions on blah, 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 but the bottom line is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, Innocent people who get caught in the crossfire of this and get killed, already have been killed, and there's so many more that could possibly be killed. And, and so be praying uh, that God, you know, Jesus says that the reason we have violence in the land is because the, the rulers don't know the ways that make for peace. They don't know the ways that make for peace. So pray, God, open up those hearts to somehow give them an understanding, a vision of, of, of a different way. It doesn't always have to be this merry-go-round, tit for tat, get even, retaliation, vengeance. There's no end to that, as history has shown. So pray that God gives these folks wisdom and that there's some openness for them to receive that wisdom in Jesus' name. All right? All right. So we've been in the series, uh, Dear Church, uh, looking at the seven letters to the seven churches uh, in Asia Minor that the book of Revelation is most explicitly addressed to. And in, in, we saw in each of these letters... Uh, Jesus has some things to affirm about each of the congregations, and then he has some things to challenge each of these congregations. And we dealt with the seventh letter last, last week. Um, and uh, um, so it's a kind of a report card that Jesus is giving these churches, right? It's, it's a report card. Here's the state of things where you're at, because Jesus speaks truth, always speaks truth. And we need a report card because, as we said last week, we've got a goal. Individually and collectively, we have a goal. And the goal is to be, is to be totally conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, to be transformed into his likeness, his love, uh, to be living out this cruciform love uh, for one another, for ourselves, and, for, and, and, and for the world. That's the goal. And since there's a goal, you need to ask sometimes if it's a serious goal and you're not just playing around, you got to check and say, how are we doing? How are we doing on this? And this is what these seven letters are. And at the end of each of the seven letters, uh, the, the end with this. Here's the last one. Uh, Revelation 3.22. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Of course, he's assuming that they all have physical ears because they just heard what the Spirit was saying to the seven churches, if you're talking about physical hearing. But there's a deeper kind of hearing that he's talking about. You have a spiritual ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And the churches he's talking about are, first and foremost, the seven churches of Asia Minor, because that's who it's written to. And we have to understand the book of Revelation from that perspective, from their perspective. But the fact that John has seven churches, most scholars agree that that's not coincidental. Numbers are never coincidental in the book of Revelation, and seven especially. Seven is the number of wholeness, or perfection, or completeness. And so while he's speaking specifically to the seven churches of Asia Minor, he's also got in mind the, the, the church as a whole, or the Spirit has in mind the church as a whole. And so it's saying, let the church as a whole hear what the Spirit is saying to these seven churches but also what the Spirit is saying to the church as a whole. And so the team that helps me put together the messages for each weekend and, and outlines all that, they thought it might be good to ask the question, what is the Spirit saying to Woodland Hills Church specifically? If Jesus were to write a letter to Woodland Hills Church, what would he affirm? And what would he challenge? And so... I, I thought it was appropriate to ask the pastors and the staff, we've been practicing waiting on God, listening to God, praying together. And so it seemed appropriate to ask them for some feedback on this. What do you think the Spirit, let's all, let's all lean into this together. What do you sense the Spirit is saying to us today, here and now at Woodland Hills Church? Uh, what, if Jesus were to write a letter to us, what would he write? And we prayed about this, and folks discerned, and they gave feedback on this. We had a time together where we prayed and gave feedback on this. And it was kind of confirming, because there's quite a bit of overlap. People are sensing similar things. And then what I did is I took these various uh, insights and suggestions, and I kind of distilled them into three different messages, three different letters of what we sensed Jesus would say to Woodland Hills Church, affirmative but also challenging. And so today I want to give the first of three messages that we believe Jesus is saying to the church at Woodland Hills. And I'm actually going to put this in a letter format similar to the, the letters in the book of Revelation. And since the book of Revelation addresses, the letters are actually addressed to the angel of the church of the seven, the angel of each church, um, this overseeing angel, I, I also address this one to the angel of the church, to, to the angel of Woodland Hills church. Um, I want to make it clear that this letter does not have the same status as the letter that we find in the book of Revelation because those are divinely inspired. All right, so this is not, we're going to add on to three more letters. No, this is us discerning what we sense the Spirit is saying, what Jesus is saying to the church of Woodland Hills. But it's always mediated through us and take that into consideration. But we just ask that as we go through this, this is what the leadership of Woodland Hills is discerning the Spirit saying to us. But you have to be, just be open in your heart to, to uh, affirm, uh, confirm, or be convicted by what is shared here. If it doesn't land, it doesn't land. Fine. If it does land, it does land even better. And so let's all lean in on this and discern for ourselves what the Spirit is saying to Woodland Hills Church. So here's the letter, the first of three. And Lord, thank you for the Spirit that is here already that we've sensed in the worship service. And Holy Spirit, we're asking that you now infuse this time with your authority and your love and, 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 and grow us, convict us, encourage us, whatever is needed. Apply this word to each of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. To the angel of Woodland Hills Church in Maplewood, Minnesota, this is the word of the Holy One who abolishes lies with the sword that comes out of his mouth. Listen to what the Spirit says is saying to you today. You are admirably committed to being grounded in Scripture and to defending my loving character. And I am delighted with the way you are helping many to worship me with all of their minds. I applaud your, fear, your fearlessness in embracing challenging questions. And you rightly celebrate your different perspectives on minor doctrines, on minor matters. And I rejoice in your willingness to assume positions that are unpopular in the broader culture, such as my call to enemy-loving nonviolence. Nevertheless, Woodland Hills, I have this against you. 
Last night, Mary was saying, could we just stop at that, the encouraging part? Oh, that's kind of... <laughs> like the church of Laodicea, many of you have lost your first love. Some have grown accustomed to feasting on kingdom ideas, but have neglected the truth that even the best ideas are worthless <coughs> unless they bring about a change in the way that you live day by day. And those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying this morning. I call on you to open your hearts and let the Spirit empower you to translate your head knowledge into action. Revive and refresh your first love. Awaken the Spirit that I have placed in you. Your time of rest is coming, but it is not yet. This is the time to seek first the kingdom and all of the right relationships that come with it. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to Woodland Hills Church. Amen. 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 Okay. I want to talk about this, 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 this call to be refreshed, to be revived. But let me talk about revival for a little bit. We don't use that word very much anymore. We need revival. Uh, when I was, first became a Christian back in 1974, uh, it was in a Pentecostal church, and they talked about revival a lot. Uh, we had revivals at different times throughout the year, but the major revival was always in the summertime. Uh, and uh, man, did we get revived. Now, this is a Pentecostal church. Some of you know what Pentecostals might be like, and this was an on-fire Pentecostal church, okay? So uh, we, were, we, were, we were hot-wired. And, and what they would do is usually they'd call up preachers from the South, because the South was always a lot more kind of wild than us stiff northern types. And, and so they call up preachers from the South to come up and shake us northerners up, Scandinavians up, uh, so that we'd uh, kind of loosen up and get the Holy Ghost and, and, and start moving and shaking. And, and, and that's kind of what the revival was about. This revival time, in fact, there's some folks in the congregation here or online that I know of who, were, who knew me back in those days. Camp Galilee, we used to go to every summer. Camp Galilee. And that's where we had our revival times. The southern preachers would come up here, and they'd work the crowd into a total frenzy. And some of these services would get pretty crazy. I mean, people would be twisting and, and, and spinning and shouting and, and running, you know, and, 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 and uh, jumping over pews and, and, and singing and laughing and crying. And it was just, it, it was an emotional, you know, kind of pandemonium kind of a thing. And that was, the, to us, the evidence that the Holy Spirit was working. And the, the more activity you had, it's like, whoa, God's really moving. Um, it, it, it was, there's a reason why they call us holy rollers. <laughs> On occasion, it would happen, someone would fall on the ground, and, and, and they're rolling, and, and, and all the rest. After the last service, the last Camp Galilee I ever went to, actually, that's not true. I went back a couple of years ago just to check it out. Uh, this is how things are. It was a little more toned down than I remember, but... Um, the, 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 uh, uh, where, where was I? I was Camp Galilee, and then, yeah, it was toned down. I got off track here. The, uh, the, 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 oh, yeah, so it was the last one I went to. Thank you for reminding me. And Shelly and I had gone. I was, at this point, I think we were engaged. And um, we uh, went, went to this service, and it was particularly crazy. I mean, at one point, the guy next to me, who was this very reserved guy, from, he was ex-military, very reserved, and all of a sudden, he jumps over the pew and then starts banging on the back of the pew going, yeah, 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 yeah. That was one of the weird things that went on. Uh, two people ran into each other in the back, we heard later on. They weren't being guided by the Spirit enough. I don't know what it was. But Shelley said, you know, we, we, we turned to 1 Corinthians 14. And there Paul says at one point, he says, now look at, you know, when you, if you have something to share in tongues, and make sure there's an interpreter, and don't do it all at the same time. If you're all speaking in tongues at the same time, if, if an outsider comes in, they'll think you're crazy. And then Shelley said, if an outsider who didn't know anything about us came into this service this night, wouldn't they think we're crazy? If that service wasn't crazy, then what would crazy look like? And she had a really good point. And she had a really good point. And that's kind of what got me thinking that maybe what we mean by revival, or this idea of revival, there's something off with it. Something's just not quite right. Now, here's the thing. It'd be, it'd be easy for me to poke a lot of fun at that because it, it was excessive, emotionally excessive. I think unintentionally, some of it was due to crowd manipulation, how to get a crowd into a frenzy with music and all the rest. A lot of it was emotionalism. But having said that, I want to immediately add that some of the most sincere people I've ever met in my life were in that crowd. I mean, they were really sincere. 
And I want to say that I thank God for that, and my experience with that, because I needed a radical break. I, I, I viewed the kind of other churches as just sort of vanilla, blah, boring, whatever, but this church had a fire, and, and I think I needed that. I needed a radical break in my life to come to Christ, and God used that. God works through any means possible. <laughs> and, and I had some genuine encounters with God. And if, I don't approve of the methodology and all the other antics, whatever, but, 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 but I really did encounter God there. And I'm grateful for my experience in, in the Pentecostal church. And most of all, I want to say this. To their credit, they at least understood that we need to get revived. You don't hear Christians talking like that very much anymore, but they saw that we need revival. We need to come alive again. That's what the word revive means, to have fresh life breathed into us. And the reason is because we live in this fallen environment, this fallen world that's oppressed by the powers. And in this fallen world that's oppressed by the powers, there is an inherent gravitational pull on us downwards. Spiritually speaking, it's a spiritual law of, 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 of gravity. And... Um, what can happen is that you're on fire for God one moment, you're all bought in, you're volunteering, you're living in the story of the kingdom 24-7. It's your life, you're on fire, you're filled with the Spirit. But if you're not careful about this, what invariably happens is you start to cool off. You start to fall asleep. You start to go back kind of to the ordinary, normal way of doing life in the surrounding culture. You still believe, but... What can happen because of the gravitational pull downward in this uh, fallen environment in which we live, if we're not careful, um, well, that belief becomes more and more irrelevant to our life. That belief doesn't impact or intersect with our everyday life very much. If we're not careful, your faith can become defined pretty much by a weekend experience. You don't think about it much in between. And even that weekend experience maybe becomes more and more rare. The word that we used to use back in my Pentecostal days for this was backslidden. And that's another word that we've lost that maybe we need to recover. You slide backwards. You slip. And maybe at first you don't notice it. In fact, usually you don't notice it. You just start to slip. But like the frog boiling in water, you just acclimate to your new situation. So you don't notice it. You backslide. Before you know it, you have a belief in God, but you're living functionally like an, like, like an atheist. We need to be revived over and over. Let, whoever's got ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. That, that, that uh, the, the way the Pentecostals went about it, I, how they went about it, I think was misguided. What they were shooting for was misguided. But they nailed it, that we do need to be revived. Somebody say amen. We need the fresh breath of the Holy Spirit to be breathed into us, to stir us up, to wake us up, to get us back in the game, to fight, to resist this downward pull that we have on us. We need a Holy Spirit revival. Somebody say amen. 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 We need a Holy Spirit revival. Holy Ghost revival, as we used to say back, back in my day. And see, this is nothing new. It's not like we're particularly, you know, spiritually dull, though that may be true, who knows. But, but, but this has been the issue with God's people throughout history. And so you see it throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, it would invariably happen that, you know, God would do something spectacular. Uh, you know, deliver the children out of Israel, part the Red Sea, send manna from heaven. And the Israelites were all like, yay, Yahweh, Yahweh is God, he is Lord, we will follow you anywhere. But invariably it would happen, in fact, it would happen sometimes very soon, that they'd backslide. They'd start chasing after false gods, especially when things got tough. they turned turn to the old securities and, and their false gods. And over and over again, this is the pattern. Yeah, Yahweh, I'll forget about you. Let's go after different gods. We tend to backslide, this gravitational pull. And so you find throughout the Bible this refrain of God's people needing to be revived and the prayer to re be revived. I'll give you a few examples of this. Uh, in Psalms, in Psalms 51, the psalmist prays this. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. This is a Hebraic poetry, and so they use parallelism, parallelism where the, the second stanza basically restates the first stanza, but in a different way. And so he says, Cre God created me a clean heart, which means renew in me a right spirit. Notice he knows he knows to be renewed. Uh, that right spirit, right related spirit, right related to God and to yourself and to one another and to the earth and the animal kingdom. Um, that, that's the righteousness of the kingdom, the right relatedness of the kingdom. Uh, the natural state for us is not to maintain that. We tend to lose that. And so the psalmist says, God, will you create in me a, 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 a clean spirit? Which means renew in me this right spirit, a clean heart and a right spirit. 
He knows that God has to do it. We can't pep talk ourselves into the way that we're dependent on God for this to happen. Now, there's things that we can do to position ourselves to get revived. We'll talk about that at the end of this message. But still, it's a God thing that it happens. We don't revive ourselves. Corpses don't bring themselves back to life. And we need God to breathe new life into us. Uh, it's the kind of thing, as we said last week, where we can't do it without God. We are totally dependent on God and God's grace. But God won't do it without us. And so being filled with the Spirit is this partnership thing with God. We have got to be willing. We've got to be open. We've got to position ourselves for this. In 2 Timothy, Paul says to stir up the gift that's within you. You're talking about the Holy Spirit. Our job is to stir it up. But it's God that's got to do it. Created me a clean heart. And then in Psalms uh, 85, the psalmist says, Will you revive us again? Bring us to life again, that your people may rejoice in you. So to the degree that you're spiritually dead, to the degree that you're backslidden, you're not walking in the joy of the Spirit, the joy of the Lord, the joy that just comes from knowing the God of this universe. But to the degree that we are revived and God's Spirit is moving in us, to that degree we begin to enter into the joy of the Spirit. That's why he says, revive us again, Lord. Revive us that we may enter into this joy with you. And note that, that in the first passage I read, the, the prayer was an individual prayer. Lord, revive my heart. Clean my heart. Give me that right relationship heart. You've got to do it. But in this prayer, it's a revive us. It's a corporate prayer. And so we need to be praying both. God, revive me, stir me up, grow me, stretch me, conform me to the image of Jesus Christ, fill me with your spirit, but also, God, fill us. Pour out your spirit on us. Uh, because to some degree, we shared this before, we all stand or fall together. There's a reality to this thing called Woodland Hills Church. We are a body together. And, uh, and the, what happens to the whole happens to each, and what happens to each happens to the whole. So you pray, God, revive me, but also, God, revive us. Amen. Psalms 119, he says, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. This idiom, my soul clings to the dust, it, it it's, uh, has the connotation of I'm close to death. I'm close to, the only thing I got left to cling to is dust. You know, dust you are and dust you shall return. And uh, the, this, the psalmist is saying, spiritually, I feel like I'm on the verge of death. You ever been there? Like you're just like uh, on life support, your spirit just, he cries out, God, revive me. It, 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 similar to the way that you, you took Adam and, and he was simply dust, but you breathed life into him and he became a living soul. Well, right now, God, my spirit is dead. Will you breathe life into me like did Adam and make me a living soul once again? Bring me to life. Refresh my spirit. And in the same way that there's a, a, a second law of thermodynamics is called. It, it, it's the law of physics that says all things tend towards entropy, towards randomness, towards decay, towards death. That's just the natural state of affairs in this fallen world. And so there's this law that is killing all of us right now. <laughs> We're all heading towards death. Hallelujah, happy day. Second law of thermodynamics. But see, there's a similar second law of spiritual dynamics, right? Where, where if you think you're coasting, you're not. There's no coasting here. Uh, there's a downward pull. There's this pull towards decay, pull towards death. And so our spirit will be tending towards dust unless the spirit of God is infusing us with new life. We don't have it in ourselves. We're totally depending on God for this. God, give us your life. Give us your spirit. Refresh our spirit by breathing into us new life. So the, the, this prayer is, is a constant in the Old Testament. Revive us, restore us, because they're aware that, that they're backslidden or they're at least in the process of backsliding. And this is why you find throughout the Old Testament, God promising his people that I will revive you. I will restore you. One example is, is Zephaniah chapter 3. I love this passage. It says here, the Lord your God wins victory after victory and is always with you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Lock that in. He's always with us. He celebrates and sings because of you. And he will refresh your life with his love. So follow this. God celebrates and sings over. Okay, he's like, oh, I, he's singing over Israel. He's celebrating Israel. Um, and that's why he promises to refresh them. Because I sing over you and dance over you, I'm going to refresh you, which means, get this, he's singing and dancing over them before they're refreshed, before they're revived. While they're still spiritually dead, he's singing and rejoicing over them. So lock this in. Uh, the key to being, having your spirit revived, getting back on fire, recovering that first love, 
that you once had. The key to that is not to have some preacher shame you into it or not to have some preacher threaten you into it. Oh, here's the dire consequences if you don't. No, the key to being revived in your spirit is to once again catch a, the, a glimpse. All it takes is a glimpse of the true beauty of the God who sings and celebrates you while you're still backslidden. While you're still, you don't want anything to do with him. He's still celebrating you because he still loves you and he knows what you're capable of and he's committed to seeing you become that, so he's celebrating you ahead of time. God celebrates and sings over you before you're, you're, you're restored and that is what restores us is when we see the beauty of the God that we're, that, that, that we're worshiping and, and you understand it's unconditional love. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, it's the love of Christ that compels us. Saint Corinthians, love of Christ, it's the beauty of Christ, the grace of Christ, the glory of Christ. It moves us on, it stretches us, it pushes us beyond what we normally are capable of or what we normally want to do. It's the love of Christ. That is the fuel that the kingdom runs on. Hallelujah. And so, so, so lock that in. We are pulled to go beyond ourselves, to stretch, to always be growing, not by shame or fear. Perfect love casts out fear. But rather, it's, it's catching, it's rekindling that first love. See, getting a renewed vision of the God whose beauty pulls us and convicts us and transforms us into his likeness. Hallelujah. So that's the Old Testament pattern. And that is enough to tell us that it should be a regular part of uh, all of our spiritual lives that we are regularly praying for revival. God, revive us. Uh, revive us. Revive me and revive all of us together. Uh, now this pattern, it continues into the New Testament. In fact, if anything, there's a greater urgency in the New Testament than the Old Testament. Uh, call for God's people to be revived, to wake up to get in the game, to recover your first love. And that's kind of surprising because unlike the Old Testament and the New Testament, when we commit to Jesus and, and put our trust in him, the Bible tells us that we're filled with his spirit. Where his, he puts his spirit inside of us. Um, and that spirit is inside of us. It's the spirit of God Almighty. It's the spirit of Jesus. It's the spirit of the creator. And that spirit is put inside of us to empower us to now... Be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ individually and collectively. Uh, it empowers us to be the most loving version of ourselves as we can be. It empowers us to live out God's will on earth as it is in heaven, to live to bring that about. So the Holy Spirit is there to empower us, to be walking in the joy of the Lord and the peace of the Lord. And so we've got God Almighty dwelling inside of us, and yet still, still, even though we've got this tremendous advantage, we find over and over again the New Testament telling us to wake up, to get out of our slumber. To stir up the gift that's within in, in you. So, so we read this in Ephesians 5, for example. Paul says, sleeper, awake. Whoever has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. If you're asleep, Paul is saying, wake up, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, what's interesting here is that Paul is not talking to pagans out there. He's talking to believers, the same believers he's been talking about throughout the whole book of Revelation. I mean, all, the whole, whole book of Ephesians. Um, and so he says to these believers, and he never questions the authenticity of their faith. He never questions their salvation. But he does question whether they're awake or not. So it, it's the impression I get is sort of like, you know, if you have come upon somebody who's drunk and you need them to sober up really quick, you slap them in the face, wake up, sober up. I don't know if that works or not, but that's the kind of picture I get. Paul's saying, wake up, get out of your slumber. Put off that groggy mindset of yours so that the light of Christ and the love of Christ and the life of Christ can flow into you and start bringing you to life again. Rise up from the dead. Right now, you're spiritually dead. Oh, but the Spirit wants to wake you up so that the light of Christ can shine on you. The light's been shining all along. The light doesn't stop shining. He's the light of the world. He just does what he does. But if you're asleep, you won't notice it. If you're asleep, you won't benefit from it. If you're asleep, you won't be transformed by it. If you're asleep, you'll be walking through life as though that wasn't true. So Paul says, wake up, wake up, recover that first love. Then enjoy that the spirit, that, the first love of Christ. Then enjoy that life and light flowing into you and flowing through you. Because that's the norm of the Christian life. That's what God calls us to. That's part of our inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 5. Here's another one, Romans 13, 11. The apostle says, the hour has come, has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. He's kind of saying, look, you're already behind. We wake up. The hour's already here. 
Don't be putting it off. Now is the time to wake up. Why? Because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Well, here we have this call, wake up, sober up, remember what's going on around you. Um, and, 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 and we're once again given this teaching of the New Testament that we're to be living with the sense of expectancy that Jesus could appear at any time and that God would wrap up this whole world epic at any point. We are called to live with the, the purpose and the intentionality and the passion of a people who are living at the end of the age. That's to be our mindset, because for all we know, we are living at the end of the age. And, 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 and so we're told to wake up, to remember that, that this present world order, this fallen world order is not our home. So, so don't get too comfortable here. This isn't your permanent location. God's going to renew this earth, but in its present state, this isn't our home. Don't get too comfortable here. Don't get too clingy here. Don't get too invested here. Keep your eyes on the horizon where God's ultimate promise uh, is, 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 is waiting us. Don't get too enamored with the trinkets of Babylon. Ooh, look at this. See that gravitational pull that I was talking about. It pulls on our hearts. It pulls on our minds. And Paul tells us in Colossians 3 to set your mind on things above uh, where our life is hidden in Christ. Uh, we're, we're to be, have God in our mind throughout the day. Not that we don't pay attention to earthly things. You've got to do that, you know, paying your bills and where you're driving and all the rest. But, but to, to have a mind that is set on heaven. And when you're filled with the Spirit and on fire, that's what happens. You're, you're, you're thinking about God. You're meditating on God. It fills your day. But there's a gravitational pull downward. And you lose that, and you start just paying attention to what's on this world. And that begins to absorb all your thoughts, all your minds, all your concerns. And like Jesus said, it's like the seed that is sown, and it finds rooting and starts to grow. But the weeds, the cares of this world, he says, Matthew 13, come and, and choke that. They choke the life out of the seed that was there. If we're not careful, we just become worldlings. So wake up, stay awake, revived, refreshed. And then one more passage here. I love this one. Ephesians 5, 18 and 20. Paul says, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. I'm so glad he didn't say scotch, because, you know, I don't even like wine. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a, <laughs> absolved of this one. Okay, don't get... Don't have your brain so altered that it would lead you to debauchery. The word there is asotia. Um, it literally means, it has a, the root is, is to create a riot. And so it's riotous behavior, unruly behavior, harmful behavior. Okay? So no longer get drunk on wine, which leads to this unruly, debaucherous behavior. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And here's what that might look like. Speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the thing he's saying. Don't be drunk on wine or scotch or anything that would alter your normal mindset to the point where you might do things you otherwise wouldn't do. That's the point. You might act in ways you otherwise wouldn't act. And these are going to be ways that are riotous, ways that are harmful, ways that are offensive, ways that are damaging. Instead of being filled with something that's going to move you to do things that you wouldn't do for the worse, be filled with the Spirit because the Spirit, praise God, will motivate you, inspire you, and empower you to do things you wouldn't normally do, but for the better, for the kingdom. So if you're filled with alcohol or something else that alters your mindset, then you might be using your words uh, for unruly things, for harmful things, for offensive things, and you might be involved in actions that are unhelpful, that are wrong, that are hurtful and harmful to others. But if you're filled with the Spirit, is what Paul's saying here, well then something else comes out of your mouth. Encouraging stuff comes out of your mouth. Psalms come out of your mouth. Things that will help others come out of your mouth. And your actions, you encourage one another, you help one another. That's the evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Be pushed beyond your normal capacities. Be stretched by the Spirit of God that's in you. No longer filled with wine or something that's going to alter your, your, your mindset and empower you to do actions that are harmful, but be filled with the Spirit who always will be empowering you to speak and to act in ways that are Christ-like and that are, are kingdom-like and that reflect the love of Calvary. And here's, I think, probably the most important point for us. Paul here, when he says be filled, uses the word plerao, and he uses it in the second person passive imperative. Okay, that's the state of it. I know that's fascinating, isn't it? But see, here's the thing. What that second person passive imperative implies is it, it, it's be filled all the time. Be filled. Be being filled. 
Be in a state of being filled. Be in the process of being filled. Uh, he's not saying be filled with the Spirit and then you're good to go. And there's some places that teach that, like the, being filled with the Spirit or baptized in the Spirit is a one-time experience. And once you've got it, bam, now you're good to go. And I've heard preachers who, who encourage that way of thinking. Man, when you get the Holy Ghost, they used to say, when you speak in tongues, because that was their, their idea, that when, that's when you get the Holy Ghost. Well, once you get that, now, when, when preachers said, it's like walking two feet off the ground the rest of your life. No, dude, that's what happens when you suck on too much helium or something. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And the people who think it does, they just are set up for such disappointment. You know, I, I thought I was supposed to be living in victory the rest of my life. I thought I was supposed to you know, be able to overcome all temptation. And it never just works like that. There's no magic pill. There's no cure-all. There's, it, this whole life endeavor is a process of character development, which implies it's always a matter of striving and struggling and, and stretching and, 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 and sometimes backsliding, but being revived. So it's, it's not like a one-time thing and then you're done. If Paul wanted to say that, he would have used uh, the, the aorist tense. The aorist tense says, well, it was done once upon a time and now it's finished and that's it. But he uses this, 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 this passive imperative. So this is a mindset, a stance of life that we're supposed to have, always be being filled. The same way like someone, an alcoholic is always being filled with alcohol. They wake up in the morning and that's what they got to get all day long. Well, we're to be that way with the Spirit. Always be seeking to be intoxicated with the Spirit to the point where, to the point where we're, we're moved beyond ourselves. We're moved past ourselves. We're stretched beyond our narrow capacities. Folks, we need a revival of the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit comes into us and, and, and it first wakes us up to the ways that we have been slumbering the ways we've been sleepwalking, going through the motions, kind of fitting in with the culture. Still have the belief. Yeah, belief is all there, but it's not, it's not making much of an impact in our life. We need to be filled with the Spirit. The point where we start to rekindle that first love, that flame. We start to get that passion back. Uh, we need to, to be filled with the Spirit. To the point where uh, we're moved beyond our natural capacities in loving people. To love people beyond our natural capacities. To welcome strangers beyond our natural capacities. To forgive people beyond our natural capacities. That's part of what it means to be filled with the Spirit. To be welcoming strangers beyond our natural capacity. We need to be filled with the Spirit to the point where that joy of the Lord begins to pulsate in our heart once again. And the peace of God is residing there. Whatever's going on in the world, we need to be filled with the Spirit. Praise God. To the point where our thinking is transformed. and our Yes, our lives are transformed. Our actions are transformed. We need a Holy Spirit revival. Amen? Come, Holy Spirit, revive us, refresh us. We serve people and are willing to sacrifice beyond our normal capacities. Be filled with the Spirit. It's always going to stretch us. And that's how he transforms us into the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Bible means by walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. We need to be walking in the Spirit to the point where we're listening to the promptings of the Spirit. Maybe sometimes doing things we normally wouldn't do because we feel the Holy Spirit told us to do that. That's part of the inheritance that we have as, as, as believers. Walking in the Spirit to the point where we're open to the Spirit, giving us the gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, whatever. They're, they're, they're available to us. And to be filled with the Spirit is to be open to that and growing in that. So here's the thing. We really felt like this is such an important message. We want to do everything we can to help every person who's a part of Wilderness Hills to apply this to their lives. So we're going to get for the last 10 minutes really, really practical and give you some steps to take right here in this auditorium. In fact, if you have your phones, uh, you might want to get them out. And if you have a piece of paper, would you get that out and a pen, something to write on? Okay, there's five quick steps I'm going to lead us through here in positioning ourselves to be filled with the Spirit. First of all, just think and pray. Think and pray. And it, 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 it's always good. In fact, we should probably reverse that, pray and think. Because the, the first thing is to, be, to realize that you can't do this on your own. Uh, and to be praying, God, revive my spirit. Revive my spirit. You've got to want this. We have a role to play in this. We can't do it without God, but he won't do it without us. Uh, so pr pray, God, revive my heart. We all need that. And it's always good at the start of any kind of spiritual exercise, I find, it, to remind yourself who you're talking to and, and, and who you're dealing with. And so remember that God is defined by the cross. God is other-oriented love. God, his whole being is in your corner. He's on your side. He wants the best for you. He loves you unconditionally and sings over you and celebrates over you right now as you are, even though maybe where you are is in a really bad place, clinging to dust. Who knows? But uh, remind yourself of that because, see, that's what gives you permission to be honest. 
And honesty is absolutely essential in our relationship with God. The truth is that a relationship is only as real as it is honest. And that applies to all relationships. If you've got a relationship based on untruth, that's a false relationship, fake relationship. No, it's only as real as it is honest, and we've got to get honest with God. Um, I like to think of prayer as, 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 as a time where I, I pretend like I just died. And when I die, it'll be just, just be me stripped of all my facades, all my little stories that I tell myself to justify things. They're all gone, and now it's just the real Greg confronting the real Jesus, stripped of all lies. Truth meaning truth. And, um, and, and it's our job is to do that now. And so remind yourself who God is and, 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 and commit to being honest. And then ask the Holy Spirit, what area of your life would, would the Holy Spirit want to work on now to better position you to be filled with his Spirit? As you're praying, fill me with your Spirit. What, the, the, let the Holy Spirit just give you an idea. What area of your life uh, does, the, 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 does he want to work on? He doesn't work on everything at the same time. But what is it in your life maybe that is preventing you from being filled with the Spirit and walking in the Spirit with that peace and joy? What comes to your mind? And for some, it may be that God wants more time alone with you. Because, see, God doesn't want a casual relationship with us. He wants intimacy. Uh, and uh, an intimacy that reflects the, the, the love of the triune God. And that takes time. For some of us, he's saying, I want more time with you. Uh, I, others, it's maybe, I, I, I want more involvement in your day-to-day -day life. I, I, I want to be, be with you as you're giving thanks throughout the day and to talk to me throughout the day and to listen to me throughout the day. Why go through all your day as though you're an atheist? I, I want to be on your mind. And, and the Holy Spirit is, 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 is asking you to be invited there to fill that part of your life. It may be that, that there's something in your life that's blocking a relationship with God. Something that you need to repent from. It could be a habit, it could be a relationship, it could be an attitude, maybe your own sense of self-lordship that you think you have the right to be the boss of your own life. Maybe that's what's got to go. And for some of us, maybe it's just our sheer stubbornness because whoever, whoever is ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. Uh, the Spirit may have been convicting you about something for quite some time, and you just pretend like he's not. And I can say that because I've done that many times. I know how we do. We tell ourselves stories and get around it. Uh, but uh, this is the time of the Spirit saying, will you just give me that? It's blocking the flow of the light and love of God, of Christ shining into your life and shining through your life. Get rid of it. It's for your own advantage, to your own advantage to do that. For others, it may be that God's calling you to get more involved. You've been kind of sitting on the sidelines, a couch potato for some time. And the Lord's saying, come on, you've got some, some, some time that I could really use. And he wants you to be involved more in what... Every work of God he calls you to. Helping out on a food shelf, volunteering at a shelter, somehow serving others, carve out space in your time to serve others. For others, it may be that God's just calling you to a pattern interrupt. Uh, try something different, something new. You've been doing the same thing for the last 20, 30, 40 years. You know, and, and it's, it's that whole rule of thumb, same in, same out. If you want different results, you've got to try something different. And so explore different ways of, 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 of connecting with God. Um, you know, I, I found that, that, that um, for a long while I felt kind of guilty because I love singing with, 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 with all of you. I love praising. In the, uh, this morning I got so blessed just worshiping with all of you. But when I try that at home, it doesn't work that well. If I put on that same kind of music and I sing, it just doesn't do it for me. Um, and I, I, for a while I felt like, oh, I'm a hypocrite because I, I sing like this in, 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 with crowds, but I don't alone. Um, but I'm done with feeling guilty about that. Because see, we're all different, and we've got to... What I find is that the way I connect with God most, most in worship is when I play classical music or symphonic music of some sort, or especially if I go out for a walk in nature. Man, I can just get into the worship like that incredibly. Singing songs alone, not so much. So you just... What works for others doesn't have to work for you. You've got to kind of find uh, you know, your own way of, 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 of connecting with God. And what worked... Ten years ago, maybe doesn't work anymore. So try something different. A good book on this is by, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, what's her name? Barton? Uh, Ruth Barton. Uh, yes, it's called Sacred Rhythms. And it just tell, it talks about different kind of sacred rhythms that you can uh, get involved in. Like Family Rituals, which is an incredible ministry, by the way. Uh, check out that. Although I wouldn't recommend having kids just so you can be part of Family Rituals. Dan was a little bit off his rocker on that one. Okay, so... I'm going to take 30 seconds here and just, uh, just wait on the Lord and just see what comes to mind.
Holy Spirit, speak to us. What area would you like to work on with us? Teach us, Holy Spirit. Help us to be honest, whatever it is. All right. And these next four steps are really quick. I'd like you right now to write that down. Oh, no, first ask, what, what, what uh, baby steps can you take? What, what are the first steps you can take towards this goal? Whatever it was that the Holy Spirit gave to you, and if you didn't get it now, that's fine. Try to discern it later on. But given the goal that the Holy Spirit wants to work on, what are the first steps you can take to that end? Just think about that. Don't think like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, communing with God all day long from now on. Uh, well, that, that's, God wants more time for you. That's good. Uh, but before you try all day, why don't you start with 15 minutes? You know? uh, try carving out. If you're not doing anything, now try 15 minutes where you're going to carve out to be with God. And that may grow to a half hour next year or whatever, but start with what is doable. If you bite off more than you can chew, you just get discouraged. Start with what is some action step you can take today to start on this new road. All right? And then write it down. Next step is I want you to write, there's a thing about concreteness. When you write it down, it, it, it makes it more real. The more of your whole self you put into anything, the more real it feels. So if you have your phones out, you can write that down on your phone or a pad of paper. Um, if you got nothing to write it down, we'll just remember it and write as soon as you get home. But write that down. What, what first steps can you say? What is the goal that you're looking for and what are the first steps you can take towards getting towards that goal? The third thing is, we're in this together. We're learning to love together. We're learning to be Christ-like together. We're trying to learn how to listen to the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit and to be revived by the Spirit together. So what we'd like it is when you write down what your first steps are, what your goal is, what your first steps are, would you send it to us, text it to us? Because we want to collect these, and it'll be anonymous, promise that no names can be shared here or anything like that. But we want to kind of know where people, what people are working on because we're in this together. And what you're doing might encourage somebody else, might inspire another idea for somebody else. So we want to share this as much as possible. So please write down what it is the Spirit wants to work on, what your steps are, and then text that to us. Do we have the text on there? Where do they text us? Oh, it's right there. I don't see it, but oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Let us know, all right? And write down that number. And the final thing is, Tell someone. There's something about, and you have this in the scripture about the power of words and, and inviting another in on what you're doing. That further solidifies it. If, if we don't solidify it, don't commit to it, don't engage in, in writing and telling others, it's unlikely we'll carry follow through on it. But following through on this is everything, you guys. And so I encourage you to tell someone, hey, here's a new commandment. It may be that if they're a spiritual friend of yours, that... that uh, they share what they're working on. Now you can work on it together because everything in the, in the body works better through community. Uh, I'll, I'm going to close with this prayer to be revived. Uh, I want to remember that we've got Tuesday Musecast. We go deeper on the message that way. Or we've got uh, the gathering groups. Encourage you to get, maybe you have not gotten involved with that. Maybe that's one of the things the Spirit's calling you to get involved in our gathering groups. Uh, meet people from around the world online. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and um, we got prayer up front for anyone who needs prayer. Prayer for this baptism, this filling of the Holy Spirit. Or it could be prayer for any other matter. And online we've got prayer as well, so take advantage of that. Holy Spirit, revive us. Breathe into us new life. Send the wind of your Spirit upon us, individually and collectively. We want to be a people who are empowered by you, transformed by you. Restore to us our first love. Give us that first love vision of your beauty that motivates us to go beyond our normal selves, to be stretched, uh, to, be, uh, to let ourselves be uncomfortable doing things maybe we haven't done before, but they're of the Spirit. Lord, work in us and through us beyond our natural capacities to be transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Be revived. Amen. Amen.